the food you eat, the land you live on, the roads you travel. We're reporting on the primary cause for species extinction worldwide. How does our very existence lead to the death of other species? And what can we do to stop it? Only on this episode of EcoWatch. The origins of habitat loss date back to the beginning of civilization itself. What do you need to build society? Resources. Where are those resources? Natural habitats. For almost 300 years, most Americans viewed the forest as an inexhaustible resource. Forests were the first victims, decimated for building materials and to clear land for agriculture. In the United States' developing years, approximately 1-2 to two hectare acres of land was cultivated for every person added to the population. Other habitats, such as wetlands and plains, soon followed. However, after the first and second industrial revolutions, we weren't just clearing land. We were pumping chemicals into the water and releasing pollutants into the air. We weren't just destroying habitats by physically wiping them out. We were redefining the conditions such habitats and species are subject to. In order to solve this issue, we first need to understand that there are three different kinds of habitat loss, all with their own causes and solutions. Destruction, fragmentation, and degradation. The raising of habitats is easiest to see. Towns and cities decimate the habitat they rest on. Forests are completely cleared for agriculture. Even water resources can be completely transformed by land reclamation seen in places like New York City or Boston. Fragmentation occurs when habitat is chopped up into smaller pieces, which may not be as large or connected enough to find mates, support migration, or find food. Most commonly, the roads forming impenetrable borders are the primary culprit, but the clearing of vegetation from fires or urbanization can also be a cause. Finally, degradation of the habitat's quality, caused by more indirect factors rather than real physical change. Runoff containing various fertilizers such as phosphorus can cause a mass growth of unwanted algae and create underwater dead zones, like the recent bound of red tide in Florida. Global warming caused by fossil fuels can also lead to ocean acidification, bleaching coral reefs and permanently altering aquatic ecosystems. Invasive species introduced by humans can also play a role, such as the kudusu vines introduced from Asia that can block sunlight from reaching forests, killing trees. All three of these combine to make an increasingly deadly combination, with as many as 30 to 50% of all species possibly heading towards extinction in the next 40 years. 2,100 species of amphibians, 1,183 species of birds, 1,851 species of fish, 13,251 species of plants, 1,999 species of mammals across the globe are categorized as threatened or worse. 99% of those species are at risk because of human activities. Time is running out. Even if you hate animals, the economic impact can be substantial. If the local habitat isn't capable of regulating itself, you might be paying the price. In the United States, invasive species cost an estimated $120 billion annually in control methods. Zebra mussels in the Great Lakes clog water intakes at water treatment facilities. Kudusu vines that rapidly grow on power lines and other infrastructure must be removed. Preservation of species can also boost your local economy. Animal tourism, such as birding, can generate a large cash flow and have the potential to create jobs. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service calculated that birders spend over $36 billion annually on equipment and travel. That money ripples through the economy and generates an additional $82 billion in output employing 671,000 people and enriching state and federal governments by over $10 billion. Every day we allow these species to suffer, our local economy suffers as well. Important steps have been made to combat this problem. Over the years, we've made strides to improve environmental regulations and prevent habitat degradation. Initiatives such as wildlife crossings can decrease the effect that roads have on habitat fragmentation allowing species to migrate and find food in larger area. Protections on extremely crucial habitats have also been put in place to prevent the further decline of animal or plant populations. 
while you might not be able to do any of these things yourself, you can still make an impact by changing your behaviors. To prevent waste that might affect certain habitats, try to use more natural alternatives to products you commonly use, like natural fertilizers or reusable bags. As well, you can volunteer time and money to local organizations dedicated to restoring local habitats. Petition or sit in on government meetings to promote habitat relocation, habitat enrichment, and higher standards for agriculture and construction pollution. Even preserving the land on a local scale can have a big impact. For example, birds. Each year, birds migrate to and from their breeding and wintering grounds. Therefore, they require various stopover sites in order to find food and rest. Every patch of land we make available to species matters. This is why our local Aspetuck Land Trust has created a detailed plan to create an 18,000 acre green quarter to protect natural habitats, extending through Fairfield, Westport, Weston, Easton, Wilton, and Reading. Here to tell us about local efforts is Jory Telser, a local birder and member of the Aspetuck Land Trust. What's the green quarter concept? Well, the green quarter concept is an initiative engaged by the Aspetuck Land Trust that it's a proposed plan to create two pathways down from Reading and Easton down to Westport and Fairfield and Norwalk. And what that does is by using patches of already claimed land from mainly the Aspect Land Trust, but also other land trusts and parks, uh, it creates pathways for wildlife, an uh, animals, birds, butterflies, um, other mammals to safely move but the key to that plan is that engaging homeowners to make their yards more animal and wildlife friendly. So by planting native plants or allowing or getting rid of invasives, uh, planting native pollinators for birds and hummingbirds, um, insects, as well as creating um, natural habitat for other mammals like deer and um, other mammals to move through. And that really is where we are in conservation right now because there's not enough land left to protect. There's no large parcels of land left to protect. So really engaging the home owners to you know, empower them to make land that is uh, suitable for, habit, uh, for wildlife is really the key to conservation today. There are many things being done both globally and locally to help fight this issue, and you can be a part of it. Become active with nature organizations and support local initiatives such as the Green Corridor. Together, we can protect and preserve habitat that supports our planet's biodiversity.